podcast is brought to you by LMU Munich. So I have to start with a, uh, a ratum. I apologize for actually maybe a few erratums. Uh, in the lecture notes, and since I was blindly following the lecture notes yesterday, I said some absolute rubbish about light cone gauge. I want to correct myself. So we went through, and you, I get a problem was to drive the a n minus was one over two p plus sum over m. And it's sort of implicitly true. But this is only for n not zero. There isn't an a n zero oscillator. Well, I haven't defined an a n oscillator. And then I later on, I said, oh, well, we have to normal a zero, normal order a zero. Well, there isn't an a zero. You don't have to normal order a zero. So a minus m. That, that, that was rubbish. It's in my notes, and I'll correct it. <laughs> what the, the formula you get, of course, is you get a, moment, a space time momentum conservation condition plus n plus n tilde. And it's this guy, which is basically this object here, that has to be normal ordered. It's not this. This is, so I apologize about that. Um, Apart from that, the story remains the same. It's, it's just it's the ends that require normal ordering. Um, and the other thing you may have noticed, some people noticed, at least one, in the, in the lectures, I talked about, in the notes, I had that the partition function was some sum, or as people have noticed, they want me to call it a trace. Fine, call it a trace. And I in the notes, I had that it was this, a minus l, l. This corresponds to a normalization of the A's where you have AM commutator AN uh, equals M delta MN. It's, sorry, this, correspond, this, this corresponds to the choice where you don't have the M there. But in our notation, we've been normalizing them so that there is an M here, in which case there's no L there. Okay. You can see that, because obviously to get rid of this m, I s we scale by square roots, but then the square roots pop up here. So it, with the conventions of this course, I should have written this, and because we've used this convention. OK. So, um, I'll move the joke. Um, so we're continuing with the partition function. We want to look at its uh, physical interpretation now, or at least a physical interpretation. And I'll be honest with you, I'm motivating it because it's important for D-brains, but I'm not going to discuss D-brains. So you'll undoubtedly hear more about this um, in the D-brains lectures for Blue and Hagen. Um, OK. So we had our partition function, which, OK, I'm going to write it as trace. That's what everybody seems to want. So some more trace is up to you. Uh, Q to the L0 minus 1. And I could also write this as 2 pi t L0 minus 1. OK. Well. One thing you'll notice is that the integral from 0 to infinity of dt um, of e to the minus 2 pi t l naught minus 1 is, well, maybe there's a factor of 2 pi, 1 over l naught minus 1, at least formally, right? And I can think of this, I expand out what it is. 1 over uh, alpha prime p squared plus the number operate, well, plus m squared. That's alpha prime m as well. Let me do it this way. Alpha prime p squared plus m squared. Oh, yeah. And I'm doing open strings. OK? So that looks like a propagator. So. 
And in fact, what you can think of is, don't think of a string with all its fancy bells and whistles. Just think of the tower of states. There's a whole bunch of states. Right now, we're just doing free strings. So you can just think of a whole bunch of states. Sometimes you can just think of a string as a device that labels nicely all the states of this tower. And then Z, well, not so much Z, but integral dt of Z, this looks like a trace in, in, um, of 1 over 2 pi half and prime, 1 over L naught minus 1. This simply looks like a one-loop diagram where you sum over all states going around a loop. And so one picture of this is you, I've just got a loop of particles going around. Or if you like, since it is a string, I've got an open string of some fixed length, which then goes around. Now, we know the answer. And also, there is some sort of significance to this t variable now. If you think of it as Schwinger proper time. But also, um, so of course, uh, what's the relevant variable? You see, there there's a cylinder. And the cylinder is specified by two, oh, I should, have, should have drawn on it. Probably aren't going to draw it. So we have this cylinder. Now you'd say a cylinder is specified by two variables, which is its, its radius, r, and its length, l. And this is the string world sheet. But the string is conformal, so it doesn't depend on l and r. It just depends on their ratio. And you can identify t as r over l. This cylinder. And then um, you can think of the various limits. What does t equal 0 correspond to? And what does t equal infinity? So uh, okay. I want to make sure I get this the right, the right way around before I start waffling. Um, OK, yeah. So the t equals infinity limit is, of course, where the radius is large compared to the length. So you, you could say where the string is very short. When the string is very short, the massive tower is very massive. And, or if you like, when the radius is very large, that, that, that loop it, from a particle perspective is very big, and it's the lightest states that dominate the partition function, the sum of the traits, because the others all decay off exponentially. So we know, then, that this trace, 1 over 2 pi alpha prime, well, we've computed this. It's the integral dt of eta of t. And we can expand eta of t. Uh, and it looks like, well, um, it's got a 1 over, well, I'm going to write it as 1 over q first, if you like. But of course, q is e to the minus t. And then what? Well, it's got 24 times q, is to q to the 0, if you like. And then plus dot, 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 where dot, dot, dot are positive powers of q. So of course, if you wanted to, you could write this as dt e to the, two, e to the 2 pi t plus 24 plus things that are like order e to the minus 2 pi t. So in the large t limit, these are all the massive string modes open string modes, and they're just giving it exponentially decaying contribution. This is the tachyon ground state. It's giving it exponentially growing contribution. And these are the, the 24 physical modes of the massless, which give a order one contribution. And that's what eta, if you expand eta out, if you remember, uh, we introduced it. It's just a device that was counting string states, and q was a placeholder, I said. And this is what I mean when I say q is a placeholder. If you look at the q to the minus 1, you, you get the ground state. You look at q to the 0, you get the first excited state. If I expand q here, q of order 1, that should be the second excited state. Well, how many of those are there? Well, 
There will be things like, uh, where can I look? Well, I'll just do it here. So at order Q, sorry, order Q, that's the second excited state. So then you're looking at things like A minus one, A minus one on the ground state with any value of mu nu of, of light cone, so Ij. Or I've got A minus two I. So there's 24 of these and there's 24 squared of these. So you can add that up. I don't know what the answer is. Well, it's 24 times 25, right? So that would be the number that appears here. I uh, should be able to do that because that's a four, 600, apparently. Anyway, if you expand that out, it's counting for you the states that propagate. And by expanding at large t, you're looking at cylinders which are very fat and short, if you like. And it's the light, the light modes of the open string that contribute. Well, what about the opposite limit? What about the limit where the uh, tube gets very, very thin? Yeah? So we want to consider t going to 0. Well, this expansion is no good at t goes to 0 because all these numbers become in order 1. But we can use this wonderful modular property to figure out what's going on at t equals 0. So we have that we've got the eta of e to the minus 2 pi t. So tau is i e to the minus 2 pi t. And, and we can go tau goes to minus 1 over tau bar. Yeah? So that would mean that this, so minus 1 over tau bar, not tau bar, just, one of, just minus 1 over tau. Well, the i just goes to minus i, which goes to back to i, and of course this just changes to plus 2 pi t. Ah, I apologize. Oh, see, these, these morning lectures are a bad idea. Uh, it's just t here, sorry. <laughs> and so minus t is just i over t. Sorry. Um, so this is rubbish. And here it would be minus 1 over t. And so if I want to evaluate the t goes to 0 limit here, that's the same as valuing the t goes to infinity limit there. Um, and I know what this is. So I simply get the same expansion again. But with, this, with t replaced by 1 over t. So the beautiful thing of this modular property is that if I want to evaluate, if you like, the limit as t goes to 0 of eta of t, that's going to be the same as the limit as t goes to 0 of eta of 1 over t, which of course is the limit as some other t, t tilde, goes to infinity of eta of t tilde. And I know what that is. That's 1 over q tilde plus 24 plus order q tilde.
uh, no, if it, it, so tau is I T and it's eta of minus one over tau. But minus one over tau is just one over T, I over T. So I'm just, I keep changing between tau and T and T tilde and tau tilde. So here we get a nice answer too. So we can say that what does it correspond to? It corresponds to a very small circle of string. And what's dominating at small circles are the, the very massive modes, right? The very high energy modes, the short distance physics. And it's remarkable that we've got a nice answer out, and in fact, we've got the same answer back. Now, this isn't, this isn't safe self duality, because the reason is the following. When it's like this, you can think of it as a very small circle and very long. It's this limit. And we've done modular transformation on this cylinder uh, from the fat cylinder over there. Well, that's not so fat, that's medium size. But what you can see is, from another perspective, is this should be thought of as a closed string that starts off over here and propagates over there. So the fat one you should think of as an open string that goes in the loop, and this one as a closed string that goes down the line. And from the closed string perspective, this is an IR phenomenon. This is a very long propagation. It's the closed string is propagating over a long distance. So the dominant physics here is for the light modes of a closed string. And this is the tachyon of the closed string. These are the 24, well, there's more than 24 modes of a closed string at level one, because it's level one one. But it turns out, with boundary conditions I've chosen, you're only going to have the diagonal and symmetric ones uh, propagating through. So what's remarkable about this is that the um, ultraviolet, short distance physics of open strings is described by the IR long distance physics of closed strings. Right. And this uh, followed from the modular invariance, and it's one of the most crucial features of string theory. Um, it's responsible for many features. So here we're doing it in the open string language. So high energy open strings can be thought of as closed strings. And this is the forerunner. It's been known since year zero of string theory, basically. But it's the forerunner of ADS-CFT correspondence. Where ADS-CFT is you have a duality between gauge theory, which is basically open strings, and ADS, which is basically closed strings. And in some sense, it's, what underlies it is this implicit IRUV duality that the IR of closed strings is equivalent to the UV of open strings. So that I could, we could talk lots about that, um, but I don't have the time to do that. Um, okay, and, and if you look at the partition function of closed strings, uh, full closed strings, then you, you find a modular invariant answer, and actually this allows you to do integrals over a fundamental domain and uh, of the, the modular group, and this cuts off all the infinities, and that's what's responsible for finiteness of closed string diagrams. Okay. Now I've got a problem. I can probably squeeze it here. There. So are there any questions on that? Like I said, it was a bit of a brief introduction to it. But I think it'll appear again in B-Brains, and at least you'll know where this eta came from. Oh, just intuition. <laughs> well, no, the argument is the following. It, it's up still up there on the top board. So how did I realize T is R over RL? Well, okay, I'm doing string theory on that world sheet, this distinction here, okay? Now, because it's conformal, the only relevant parameter is R over L. So it's just a question of choosing whether T is R over L or L over R. And then I use this argument basically fixes it that in the large R limit, the large T limit, you should see the low, lightest states of an open string. Okay. Uh, so here's the problem. We'll come back to things a little later. Show that 
or a periodic fermion. Okay, so this is the first time I've mentioned the word fermion. Uh, here, L naught can be written as a sum over modes, L. Now, I'm going to stick it here. Some oscillators called D rather than A. And now I'm going to put this L factor here. And the periodic fermion has, let me check to get it right, a ground state energy of 1 over 48. We'll come back to that. No, it's periodic fermion. It's got 1 over 24, but it's got the opposite sign. Yeah. Where the D satisfy an anti commutation relation. And with this normalization, so what's going on? So L0 is very similar. It's D is anti-commuting. So phi, psi is going to have to be anti-commuting if it's a fermion, right? So D is the expansion of the Fourier modes of a fermion. So the Ds are anti-commuting. And it turns out with some normalization that the Ds and have an anti-commutation relationship that they're delta with no factor out in here, which means I have to have the factor here. So compared to the, not well, this is the standard notation for, for uh, fermions. Uh, but as I said, for the bosons, we put the factor of L here and not there. Okay, so, so for periodic fermion, that's the value of L0, but you've got fermionic creation operators. So I want you to show that um, the partition function is so this is just one of them so perhaps I should put the z1 there Q to the 1 over 24, product over L of 1 plus Q to the L. Okay. And so it's product of L of 1 that's commuting. Okay. I'll give you a hint. This is easier than doing it for a boson, at least in my opinion. And do I also say, yeah, for the record, for an antiperiodic well, what's L0? In some sense, it's the same. Um, got more oscillators, Bs, and the B satisfy a similar anti-commutation relation. So you've got a ground state energy of minus one, uh, well, of one over 48. But here, R is shifted to be half integer. Basically, you see, you're just expanding Fourier modes. We'll come back to this in the superstring. But you're just expanding Fourier. So you just expand the periodic object in terms of Fourier modes with integer coefficients. This is not periodic. It's an antiperiodic fermion. So when you expand it in Fourier modes, you expand it in integers plus a half. But otherwise, it's the same, but the vacuum energy changes. And we'll come back to this. So here, uh -huh, this becomes 1 over Q to the 1 over 48. No, that's q to the minus 1 over 48, and then product L equals 1 to infinity, 1 plus q to the L minus a half. Okay. So actually, this problem is almost the same as this. You're just changing what you mean by M and N. Okay. 
So any questions on that, on the partition function? Okay, so now I want to sort of change tune a little bit. The program for the rest of the course is that I now want to describe how one generalizes all this to a uh, curve space. And then the next top, the final topic will be superstring, which will be a pretty rapid throwing in the deep end, but since you've learned all the concepts, it's just a question of putting all the things together. Um, so a lot of research in string theory doesn't involve these world sheet techniques because it turns out to be very difficult to do this in anything but flat space. Although there has been some progress. No, well, you can't really just have open string. One reason is that in the quantum theory, uh, they all can always join up and, and form closed string. Yes, but uh, then closed string can only be the, so I don't need, suppose I'm just doing closed string. Yeah. Then I don't need open string. That's an interesting, someone asked me a similar question. Um, yeah, I mean, for example, in the heterotic string, that's a closed string theory, and it's only ever closed string. Now, in the modern language, modern understanding of the closed strings to type two, you have D brains, and those are open strings. And they are missing, they were missing for 25 years. Yeah, and they never found. Um, but you need to include them. In, although you might, it, it took 25 years to realize you need to, to include them, so it's not obvious. But for example, in the heterotic theory, that's a theory of closed strings and closed strings only. Okay. So the next topic is curved space time and effective actions. So, I want to discuss two things here. First, I want to briefly give you an idea of how we extend string theory to interacting strings. So what we've done is just free strings, right? I mean, they're properly given Minkowski space and it just brings up like that. Um, so the first one, and I'm only gonna say a few words here because it's a lengthy topic. So we've just described, and let's do closed strings now. We've just described a, a closed string propagating like this. Right, that's what we've done. In, we're in Minkowski space, and our closed string just uh, goes up. And we've realized that this closed string has fluctuations, if you like, states which describe gravitons and, and some other stuff. So you might want to say, well, how do I do graviton scattering? So what graviton scattering is, is you'd like to have a closed string here, and a closed string there, and a closed string here, closed string there. This is a four-point scattering of gravitons. So that's the lowest order. And these closed strings come in and go out. Well, that means their world sheet will look something like this. So it can be realized as a single string world sheet with this bizarre shape that these legs that go off to infinity. Well, one of the miracles again of string theory is that we now want to compute everything not on the cylinder world sheet, but on this world sheet. 
Well, that's an odd shape. How do we cope with that? Well, there's this lovely Riemann mapping theorem. Riemann mapping theorem says that up to conformal equivalence, I can map this shape to the sphere. But not any sphere, because these points at infinity come to marked points in the sphere. So when I evaluate strings on this world sheet, I can use conformal invariance to think of it being in this world sheet. And similarly, this I could think of as a sphere too with two marked points. But okay, that's harder than doing it the way we do it. Uh, so I wanted to consider this. Well, what, the question is, what happens to these marked points? These marked points correspond to the incoming and outgoing states. And so what I want to do, yeah? Yeah, yeah. So I'm using world sheet theory, but now I'm doing it on this space, but I can just do it on that space because of conformal variance. Good luck to you, yeah. Uh, well, you know, let's just say good luck. Um, so you do this. Now, um, you have to, you've got these ingoing and outgoing states. They get mapped to these points. And there's this thing called state operator mapping, which I won't go into. But basically, it says that the state here, which, for example, you might want to be a graviton. So a minus 1 mu, a minus 1 tilde mu, e to the i k dot x. And k is the space-time momentum of this graviton. That's the state, so you put it on the vacuum. But you can just realize this is what's called a vertex operator. And for, for now, we'll just realize it like this. So let me put g mu nu here. Wow. Let me just do this schematically. Yeah. And of course, you have to normal order this. And all of the meat of string theory comes from the fact that when you normal order exponentials, you get quite a weird answer, which I won't go into. Uh, because I want to translate it, I just want to give it some momentum. I want to give this, this, this is a graviton with, just think of it as a graviton with plane wave with momentum e to the i k x. So perhaps I should put back this g mu nu. So this is just some constant, say, but it's got like e to the i k x as its plane wave. So it's a graviton with momentum. Okay. Feels good. Let's just say that. Okay. So you can view this as two ways. You can view this as this state, or you can view it as this operator acting on the ground state to create this state. So what I need to do then is at each of these four points, I need to insert my vertex operator. So I put one here, and I put one here. So V of Z1. Let me label the sphere by CP, uh, the, the complex plane with the point at infinity. And so to compute this diagram, I just simply want to compute the correlator of these four vertex operators in my free conformal field theory. So this becomes equal to uh, just this correlator, which in flat space is a free theory correlator. So you can compute it, and that's what Veneziano did. And actually, you have to integrate over the positions. And it turns out, by conformal invariance, not only can you, you map it to the sphere with four marked points, but actually, you can choose this to be at 0, this to be at 1, this to be at infinity. And then there's only one, one left. So you actually only have to integrate over 1. So this, you could say, is equal to 0. And this, you could say, is equal to 1. And this, you could say, is equal to infinity. And this is equal to something called z. So you compute this correlator, and then you integrate over the positions. And this gives you Veneziana amplitude. And this is this beautiful finite answer for the scattering of gravitons. Yeah, now I'm doing it in the free field theory. In general, the, the next question is what happens if I'm not in flat? I'm still in flat space. The question is how do I compute graviton scattering? And I'm just sketching it out for you. We're not going to do it. But this is how the Veneziano amplitude arises. 
what I want you, I want you to understand is that it arises from evaluating a correlation function in the two-dimensional CFT, which is a free CFT in fact, so the free boson CFT. You compute this correlator and it, it's interpreted as having prepared these four incoming states. So whatever you like, I could have put some highly excited state, but I'm going to put the graviton. Uh, Um, yeah, yeah, perhaps I should put zero here. It wouldn't matter at the end of the day because <laughs> there's a Lorentz symmetry, so. <laughs> but yeah, okay. Um, that's a good amount. So anyway, this is how you compute. And then, well, what do I do next? Because, fine, that corresponds to, in a particle theory language, well, let me actually let me get this back. From particle perspective, this is just like a line, and this is just like a four-point amplitude. But of course, in particle physics, we know that you get loops. So how do we get loops here? Well, that's the beauty of string theory in a way, is that locally that world sheet's always the world sheet of one string. And it's simply by changing the topology of the world sheet that I am able to reinterpret it as interaction. And putting in, well, I'm putting in the vertex operator. It's the combination of the two. The interactions are a big thing. Yeah, so here, in some sense, of this language, I can't turn off interaction. But you, perhaps you have to see this lecture as a whole. Hopefully, it'll be clear in an hour. How much time do I have? 15 minutes, I think. It'll hopefully be clear in 49 minutes. Okay, so, okay, that's the line, that's the tree level contribution. What's next? Well, we want to do a loop. So here's our in and out states. But I want a loop, so I put in a loop. So you could think of this as this diagram meeting another version of itself and glued together along this line. Or you can think of it as two closed strings that come in, a loop of closed string is created in the middle and they go out. Now this, using our Riemann mapping theorem, it corresponds to, oh, let me get this right. Um, uh, well, quite simply, not the sphere, but the torus, this four marked point. Okay. So now, to compute this diagram, I have to compute the same correlator, but I have to compute it on this surface. And it's actually, it's modular invariance, as I think I mentioned yesterday, that allows you to take the same conformal field theory and define it in all of these surfaces and compute. So here I would compute this on this surface. Now this is, this is getting tricky. And in fact, you, and you can go up to two loops, and that's getting very tricky. And you can go up to three loops, and I don't think that's been done. But you can see how you construct <coughs> string perturbation theory and string interactions now. It's by introducing different world sheet topologies. Uh, and that basically orders the order of perturbation theory. But, and the interactions correspond to evaluating correlators of your CFT, which process this free boson CFT, um, on these surfaces. Now, So this motivates sort of a more formal way to proceed, which is that and now I'm going to switch to this path integral language, because I don't know any other way to say it. So the way to sum up what we've done here 
is that if I really want to compute something in string theory, I need to sum over all diagrams. And the diagrams are labeled by the genus. So of course, the genus zero, uh, genus one, and then there's genus two, and you just keep going in principle. And you integrate over what's called the, the fancy word is pike muller space, but I'm just going to call that d gamma. You have this world sheet metric. You want to you want to integrate over it because you have then you have gravity on the world sheet, but you want to integrate over it modulo diffeomorphisms and conformal symmetries, and that's called the pike muller moduli space. So it doesn't play a role in the low order diagrams so much, uh, but it does play a role in the higher order ones. Then you've got your fields to do the path integral of, and you've got e to the minus s, where s was the string action. So this is the, if you like, the partition function of the full interacting theory. And if I wanted to compute correlators, I would have to stick them in here and compute uh, term by term on these Riemann surfaces. Well. I'm still talking about free strings right now. Stri strings in, in flat space time. So, so this series just corresponds to the sphere plus a torus. Then it would be a, a two torus. And it keeps going. And you're taking your free string theory and doing whatever you need to do. First here, plus that, plus that, plus that, blah, blah, blah. Well, OK, I'm still talking about strings. Yeah. Yeah, it is. I'm, I'm now I sort of switch language to closed strings. But what I did before was just to contribute on this. It was just a trace of someone's state. That's what we, we, we computed this, basically. But viewed as an open string, not as a closed string with two insertions. And, so, and that's, yeah, the first order term from that. But for open strings. Right. So we're still talking about, yeah. Uh, I wonder if the sphere is, uh, the torus is topologically flat. The sphere is not. Yeah. Uh, so this kind of collapse to string root amplitude over all of the other. You have to wait five minutes. He has to wait 49 minutes. Uh, cast me again in, in 15 minutes. OK. So. We are describing strings in flat space um, so far. We did, it, we did pretty much everything. But, and we saw that there's graviton modes and there's diffeomorphisms. So obviously, we now have to learn how to do space, uh, to do string theory in curved spaces. So we have to generalize S string to curve background. What are our guiding principles? We're going to need it to be conformally invariant, <coughs> because ultimately we do want to couple to world sheet gravity, and that requires conformal rate. Excuse me. Um, we want it to have well, it's not going to have Lorentz symmetry with space time, but we certainly don't want. We want it to have the morphisms of a curved background put in, and uh, <coughs> well, what does that mean for our action? Well, let's try to write something down. The most general thing we can think of, but where eta is not flat anymore. So I have my d2 sigma. I have my eta alpha beta. I've gone to the flat world sheet. Make life simple. That's what we had before with eta here. 
But now we want to say, well, ether is not ether. It's a general metric. So I have to write a general metric, which would be a function of the axis. So for non-trivial metric, in fact, even for flat space written in, say, polar coordinates, this is a interacting field theory of great compli complications. But it is still naively conformally invariant, scale invariant, because it's just two derivatives in two dimensions. OK. Well, we can write down some other stuff. Ah, I also, actually, I, I want to apologize. I want to go back and put in a general metric. It's useful. What else can I have? Well, we had the B field. Well, there's another term I can write down, which is anti-symmetric. This is just the, the numerical symbol, which is equal to 0 if A alpha equals beta, and 1 if they're all different. <coughs> So this makes sense. And that's also naively conformally invariant. And then I can write down something else, which you may not have thought of. Um, I got a one off of five x times the curvature of this metric gamma. And, well, this is not conformally invariant uh, because under conformal transformations, this picks up some weird uh, factor, right? If I rescale a metric, uh, the cur Riemann curvature, by now a general function, the Riemann curvature, sorry, the Ricci scalar isn't invariant. It, it picks up some horrible stuff. But you can fix that by saying, well... Alpha prime is like the Wall Street H bar, so I can put an alpha prime here. And this is now higher order as like a quantum effect. So classically, this Lagrangian is still conformally invariant because although this term breaks conformal invariance, it does so at higher order. Okay, you might. And you also notice something else. This last term. Because there's an alpha prime here and there's an alpha prime there, it can be written as this. Oh, I need, I need a root minus g here. I'm sorry. It's just simply this. Now, if phi is constant, then I just have this. And this is actually probably minus in this convention. Um, you know, so I probably want to put let me change the size. Um, if phi is constant, or if you like, if I just extract the constant mode of phi. This is a topological invariant. It's called the Euler number. It's the reason, it's also got just the Einstein action in two, two dimensions, but that's why there's no dynamics in two dimensions. The Einstein action is a total derivative. If you vary it, you get zero all the time. So this is, in fact, chi, the Euler number, times phi. Number. That's, of course, only if phi is constant. If phi is not constant, this term is, is not so simple. That's the, assuming phi is constant, so it's like the, the zero mode, if you like. So perhaps I should put here at phi equals phi zero. Well, what's, what's the happening then? E to the minus s string. Oh, my signs are, I shouldn't have changed my signs there. OK. It, you get this contribution e to the chi phi naught. Uh, uh, with a minus sign. No, I didn't. I might, let me check the sign in a second. Um, so you see now that in that path integral expression, these world sheets get suppressed by this, this value. And chi for such world sheets 
is, is, it, is 2g minus 2, where g is the genus. So actually, I, my notes were right. I want a plus sign here, minus sign here, minus sign here, minus sign here. And so these world sheets get suppressed, <coughs> well, get weighted by a factor, um, what's usually called g string to the 2g minus 2, where g string is e to the phi, or at least the constant phi. And this is behaving as a coupling constant. It's saying, well, when g string is small, I don't have to worry about the higher genus surfaces. Where g the leading contribution is from the sphere, and then the torus, and et cetera, et cetera. So this expansion in terms of genus is, an is a small perturbative expansion when this number is small. So g string, which is e to the phi, or you can think of it as the expectation value of phi defines a number which is the uh, coupling constant for string. So does this answer your question? So at small g string, the sphere contributes the most, and the others less in, in increasing order. So that's the string perturbation thing. OK. Now let's go back to the rest of that action. I'm doing it for closed strings, yeah. Open strings, a similar story hold. Um, what happens at open strings is I can add boundary terms to that string action. And on the boundary, I can add fields, like my A mu field, my, uh, my Maxwell field. So then you're talking about closed strings with boundaries. And it's known how to order those two. All right, um, so let's return to this, the rest of the action, which looks pretty intimidating, and it, it is. But it has the nice features, I'll point out. Um, so if you look at it, it's got, what else has it got? It's, it has got the built-in uh, world sheet reparameterizations. That's no different than it was before. Um, so it has a... So it has got sigma alpha goes to sigma alpha of sigma prime, world sheet reparameterizations. You can check that. And it has also got space time reconfigurations. X mu goes to X mu function of X prime, provided, of course, that you rescale the metric the way you should. Of course, I should say, at this stage, these are all just classical symmetries. And another one at hand, of course, similarly for B mu nu. What else has it got? Well, it has, in fact, got this one, too. And the reason for that is perhaps not so obvious. Um, if I shift the B term in that action, then that term varies into the following thing. Under the, I'm just doing this symmetry. Well, 
Well, you pick up this d lambda term, but it's anti-symmetric, so you get two copies. No, there's no gamma. Um, D out of X mu. So both it's uh, both terms contribute the same because of anti-symmetry contracted here. So I just get this, and you can realize this is a total derivative, which is um, well. See, there's a contraction here, so you can think of it as D alpha lambda nu d beta x nu. And then because of anti-symmetry, you can just rewrite this whole thing as d alpha lambda nu d beta x nu. So it's a total derivative. And since it's a closed string with a closed world sheet, it goes away. So this action has all the symmetries that we wanted. It's got diffeomorphisms of the target space. It's got the shift of the B field. And it's conformal at lowest order in alpha prime. Yeah. Um, this Sorry? Why? Sorry? Yeah, you have to have that last term. Uh, well, to gravity. Um, well, that is the mantra of string theory, is that you are uh, you're coupling the theory to world sheet gravity. That you want, and then you integrate out of the gravity of the, so you, in, you do have gravity on the world sheet. Yeah? And so you need to add such a term. Now, if you, I mean, it's string theory. If you went through life and didn't have that term, it's called the fraction Saitland term. And certainly people did string theory until like 1984, until that term was realized. Um, but certainly if you do the string theory, it's predicted. Uh, it, it maybe if you wait, you have to wait 10 minutes to answer that question. Um, maybe, it, maybe I sound like a US politician always proposing answers that don't come. OK, any politician. Um, OK. All right, so all those symmetries I mentioned are just classical. So this one's, this one's, and of course, finally, it is conformally invariant, or scale invariant would be a better word, but only at lowest order in alpha prime. Why do I say that? Well, OK, that last term, the fraction Saitland term, uh, violates conformal invariance, but it's of order alpha prime. So an alpha prime is like h bar. But also, these are all classical symmetries. And they could be broken in the quantum theory. And we want the quantum theory. We, we don't want that. We have quantum strings. So we have to do the quantum theory just described by this. And in the quantum theory, all these symmetries might be broken. Well, it turns out that reprogrammatizations uh, and diffeomorphisms aren't, at least not in this particular example. You do have to be careful in, say, the heterotic string, which we maybe described briefly, that you would violate, that you have anomalies in uh, well, space-time diffeomorphisms. But we don't have that now. But what you sure as hell are going to get um, anomalies in is conformal invariance. That theory is scale invariant, meaning you know, there's no mass parameter in it. It's the simple statement of conformal invariance. But when I start computing in that theory, it's not going to be a finite field theory. Right? It's going to have divergences in it. It's renormalizable but it's not finite. So that means you have to introduce a cutoff. And once you've introduced the cutoff, you suddenly have a mass parameter in your theory, and it's no longer conformal. So what you have to do is you have to say, when is this theory finite? And it has to be finite at one loop, it has to be finite at two loops, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. 
so you have to renormalize this thing. And under renormalization, if you should think of from the, from the sort of two-dimensional field theory, and under the, from the two-dimensional field theory point of view, g mu nu, b mu nu, and phi are just coupling constants. Yeah? They're the analog of g yang mills and the yang mills gauge theorem. So they're the things that get renormalized. So in perturbation theory, world sheet perturbation theory. So this is a different expansion. I don't mean going from genus 1 to genus 2 to genus 3. I mean pick your genus. Pick genus 0. Pick whatever genus. It doesn't matter because the divergences come from the short distance physics. So you might as well just look at that step. Um, so this is not a genus G ex expansion. It's not expansion in G string. It's an expansion in alpha prime, which is the world sheet H bar. So in world sheet perturbation theory, I, I expansion in alpha prime. S string needs renormalization. And breaks conformal symmetry. So in general, that means that you have to add counter terms. So, you know, g mu nu really should be thought of as a bare g mu nu. Plus, let's do dim reg, some cutoff, epsilon, times some renormalizable part, some regulating part. And, and similarly for b mu nu and phi. Okay. So this would write like conformal symmetry. So our equations say, well, we need conformal symmetry. And we need it at all orders in alpha prime. But we certainly need it at lowest order in alpha prime. And so that comes from saying, well, demanding conformal invariance. sets this thing here, which, by the way, is often basically called the beta function. Uh, beta function. G renormalized mu nu equals to zero. OK. So this gives you a constraint on your theory if you want it to be conformal. And it's, it's going to pick up contributions from every order of perturbation theory, every order in alpha prime. So what do you get? So again, I can't do the computation now. It's not that difficult, but it's, it's involved. So what do you get? So the equations you get from demanding that the beta functions for g, r, and phi are 0 are the following equations. And this is this r mu nu of the metric g, right, with space time. And then this is just the lowest order expansion, so there would be alpha prime correction.
Okay. So this looks very much like gravity, right? Where were the skeptics when I talked about gravity before? Yeah. So, could you just repeat uh, a few theorems uh, as in uh, where, what would be the norm of being away from gravity to pick up? Yeah. What about the fourth thing? So would that be the norm? No, no, no. So I'm asking that this is a suitable string background. It is a suitable string theory. So I need to make this a conformal field theory. So this, and what the question I'm answering you now is when is the theory defined by the Lagrangian on the top board a conformal field theory? Because the string theory requires that I have conformal field theory. That's the rule. I need conformal modular invariant string theory. I have field theory on the world string. Um, and this answers the question at lowest order in alpha prime. When is that theory a conformal field theory? Hence, when is it a part of string theory? Really? String theory is finite. String theory will then say, if I compute with string theory using this CFT, I'll get finite answers for string coupling on this background. But this is the question, when can I even use this on string theory? Yeah, good. Someone's playing. Someone's doing exercises. Um, so let's let's give the exercise. So this is just the lowest order in alpha prime. In some sense, this is the analog of our Klein-Gordon equation for the point particle. It's the constraint, if you like. It's the analog of the L zero constraints too, which is implying conformal invariance. So problem, and this is a little tricky as a problem, but I recommend you do it. So that these equations come from the action, it's the space-time action which I'm going to call effective action. It's a minus. Okay. So again. It's this plus higher order corrections. Well, oh yeah, let me put the alpha prime here. Okay. So that's very reassuring because we've recovered a general relativistic covariant theory in space time. So what the, the story is that I, should, I need to solve this equation to get a consistent string background about which I could compute string scattering, et cetera, et cetera, in my genus expansion. So there are, in effect, two expansions in string theory. There's the genus expansion, which is in the full string theory, where I go genus 0, genus 1, genus 2, genus 3, and it corresponds to multiple strings scattering, so multiple exchanges of strings between strings. Uh, and that's really where the the great strength of string theory is. But there's also, if I think about the world shoot physics, there also tends to be an alpha prime expansion, which is because you're looking for conformal field theories on the world sheet, but conformal field theories are hard to find. And this is the nice geometrical picture, but it, although it's classically conformal, it's typically not conformal at one loop, so you have to check this. If you go to two loops, you get an order r squared correction to this, and string theory then predicts higher order R powers to this effective action. And it goes on forever. That's not conformal. Yeah, so, uh, but you said that if I use conform, then it gets conserved as well. Uh, 
the integral over the space is, com is, a, is a topological invariant. Oh, so what happens, you see, why is it not, conf you want, so how can, is, can I rephrase your question and see if I'm right? I said that that last term was not conformal, and then I said, but if phi naught is equal to zero, it's a topological invariant. So how can it be a topological invariant and not conformal? Because, it, you know, the, the topology of the world sheet doesn't, uh, you know, depend on how big it is. Yeah, good question. Because phi is constant. So how does, R ch how does that combination change? Is what? At lowest, yeah. The higher order stuff is not. <laughs> but this is. Um, yeah, so under a conformal transformation, root minus gamma r transforms. I, I'm not going to get exactly the right answer. But it will go to like d squared rho. Uh, phi. It shifts by this. So when phi is constant, this is a total derivative. It doesn't contribute. So it's conformal when phi is constant. But when phi is not constant, I do two derivatives on it, and I, I move the derivatives onto phi. And that's the origin of this term. Not, no. Oh, what, we're here? No, not if phi, if phi is constant, then it... Oh. Okay, this might be the subtlety, right? That it, there's a d minus two, and then I do dimensional regularization, by I am paraphrasing, and that d minus two becomes epsilon. And then that gives me a, f and that gives me a contribution from the one loop divergence that cancels against a tree. So, so okay, I maybe have said things a bit too quickly. So what this does, so okay, first of all, this is good when the higher order terms are small. And then computing with this should be the same as computing in the full string theory, any operator you like. So this is why this tends to be more useful. If this is valid, then you can just do the you know, classical physics of this is reproducing for you the string scattering amplitudes of any vertex operator that's realized. This. Oh, I dropped the tachyon from here, huh? Because we're pretending it doesn't exist. Yeah, that's our little secret. Because uh, we're going to do the superstring, and then it doesn't. It really doesn't exist. So yeah, there was. There's a tachyon contribution, uh, which makes this thing even worse. I mean, it, then then everything goes to hell. Yeah. So we just stick to tachyon equals zero. Yeah. Well, yeah, modulo this argument about dim rank, but yeah. But then why is that the quantum uh, Right, but uh, so basically there's a conformal, there's a violation of conformal invariance from that term, which has to be cancelled. But that term's order alpha prime higher than the other terms. So it's cancelled by the order alpha prime, the one loop contributions from the f first terms. So the first terms are conformal at lowest order, but not at higher alpha prime. And that's actually why this guy comes in. He's coming from tree level of the Frad Fintatman term, and indeed it, it must, there must hence be a one over epsilon pole. And this guy comes from one over epsilon pole of one loop level of the first term. And together they have to sort of Okay, uh, one comment I'll make. When you do this problem, if you got the stomach, is there's a little trick.
No, no, it's, this is the preservation of conformal symmetry. Because it's, it's the fact that the, theory is, that the world cheap theory is, is, is a renormalizable theory, but it's not a finite theory in general. And conformal invariance, it turns out, it's not entirely obvious, but conformal invariance, the condition of conformal invariance is equivalent to finiteness of the field theory. So what you have to do is compute the divergences, which is basically the renormalization procedure, and then set the divergences to zero. And that's the beta function equations, that's what's on the middle board. That's saying, at one loop, I have no divergences if those equations are true. And that means at one loop I have conformal invariance. Okay, uh, so one thing to keep in mind in this problem, because there's this nasty factor out in front. This factor, why is it there? Because this means it goes like G string to the minus two, right? And that means it's coming from the lowest order world sheets. So the general alpha prime expansion, there would also be, I guess, actually, no, no, actually there wouldn't be. I was gonna say, but I don't think it's true. In principle, there might be higher genus corrections to this, but since it comes from short distance physics, I don't think there is. Um, yeah, but this factor out in here means that when you vary R, you're usually used to varying R and getting the Einstein term, right? R mu nu minus one half G mu nu R. But you don't just get that here because delta root minus G R is If I write it out, it's g mu nu, r mu nu. This is the thing you're used to. This gives you Einstein's equations, plus this term. And in, in gr, you learn that this is a total derivative. In fact, I'll tell you what it is. d mu d nu delta g mu nu minus g mu nu d squared delta g mu nu. That's what that term is. It's no longer a total derivative because it multiplies this. And that's the origin of the d mu d nu phi term in that equation. Okay, but you guys do the rest. Well, it's a scalar. Hmm? It's a scalar field. So you choose either. Okay. So, are there, are there any other questions? So that is the end of the bosonic string. I've tried to give you the basics and then outline how it extends to the full theory. But at, at this point, it's kind of silly to go on because uh, we need to talk about superstrings because, yeah, you're right. There's a tachyon here. There are no fermions. It's, it's not much good. So I've got uh, five minutes. I can at least start one or two lines on superstrings. All right. Well, you would you you would just take your favorite background, fat space. Oh, you you'd ha oh, so you'd have to well, and then you expand that to fourth order in, in fluctuations to get four point amplitude. And then you could have to compute, you could compute using that a tree loop, a one loop computation, a one loop correction. You could, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then if you wanted to do loops, you could, do, you could try doing loops in the effective theory. And then it, hmm? so you can use the effective theory when it's valid. <laughs> and the question is, when is that? Um, 
it, the real action, you mean the full string theory? Yeah. Yeah. There, there is no action for string theory. Yeah. Let, or maybe bottoms me back will change that. But basically, there's no action for it. So, um, so if I were to do, if I were to stick with this term without order alpha prime, yeah, then I'm just looking at situations where the curvatures are small. That's when it's valid. And I'm also, from the string theory point of, th point of view, doing it at tree level when this is dominant, when g string is small. So it would co now if I do scattering, if I compute one loop or something in this, it's valid when it, it should be reproducing string theory when the coupling is small and I don't need heavy states. That's one of the issues. Because in string theory, you have this massive tower of stuff. And that massive tower, is, you know, it does feel this. So for example, this is not a finite field theory. No way. But string theory is. But string theory is only with all this extra stuff. Yes. Yeah, so this, the equations of motion of this effective action are the equations up there, which are the conditions for conformal invariance at one loop. So it's the same. I mean, this one? God, no. No. no, no. <laughs> um, you know, remember, conformal invariance for us was imposed by these the, the L, LM constraints, the Thurasora constraints. And so basically, that's taking care of all that in a much more grandiose way. OK. Um, Um, okay, so you can generalize this for d not equal to 26. And if you don't put d equals 26, there's another term in here, which is roughly speaking, and again, I'm going to be off by some factors. So you get a cosmological constant proportional to d minus 26. Now the problem is d minus 26 is either 0 or order 1. And hence this is either 0 or string scale. Once this is string scale, this whole action doesn't make any sense because it ceases to be a, you know, this is a perturbative expansion in alpha prime. And at lowest order, this isn't, if this isn't zero, then this has to curve so much as to compensate for that. And then the whole effective action breaks down. Because this is order alpha prime, all this stuff I've thrown away is order alpha, it's all the same order. This is valid when the curvatures are small. If you do some background field expansion, it's like that. Okay. Um, okay. I don't know. I guess it's not worth starting superstrings for five, well, for two minutes. Um, we'll do a very quick job on superstrings tomorrow morning. Yeah, we should be able to get through it. It's just, uh, we'll add some fermions onto the world sheet and deal with the consequences.